Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome. Um, she told me that this is really a question and answer session. A and as you can see, I've got three other people with me. The reason I asked them to come is because they will answer the difficult questions. I'll pass <laughs> them on to them. Uh, uh, I was saying that, you see, the uh, <clears throat> it, I think all of us understand this very well, that uh, 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 our continent faces many challenges. Um, for years now, in 1999, the, uh, the then Organization of African Unity took an important decision that uh, uh, we would no longer, the continent would no longer recognize governments or that had uh, taken power by unconstitutional means. And indeed, we all thought that uh, when we took that decision, it was a summit meeting in Algiers, that uh, this would be a very strong deterrent uh, against all the soldiers who like carrying out military coups on the continent. But of course, you know very well what happened since then, uh, that the military coups have, have continued. The most recent one being uh, uh, in Mali. Um, but I'm saying that, you see, we all of us know that the continent has got very, very, very important challenges. Um, and it's quite clear that uh, one of the, these, these challenges is the weakness of leadership. Um, in many instances, you'd find that the reason certain problems persist uh, is because of weak or wrong leadership. Um, and so it was clear, I think, that uh, we have to address this matter. It's not easy. Uh, how do you produce the kind of leader that we need, that the continent needs, the kind of African uh, who would first of all have a, a grasp of the challenges that the continent faces? Uh, and secondly, a good idea as to where to go in order to address those challenges. And thirdly, to have whatever professional skill it might be required in order to exercise that function of leadership. Uh, I'm saying it's not easy. The professor here is, uh, uh, has been teaching that subject. Uh, uh, of, of leadership, to empower all of us to be able to provide this leadership which the continent needs, and without which leadership, it's not possible for the continent to extricate itself uh, from the problems that it's facing. So I do hope, Maureen, that is why we're all of us here. Because in the end, uh, what should be inspiring all of us yourselves here and the teachers that are sitting here is, how do we build this cadre uh, that's not just interested in a diploma, a piece of paper, or whatever, but really this to answer this question practically, what is it that we do to change our continent, our society, our continent for the better? To uh, to decide ourselves where the continent should be, not listen to other people, um, and do what, ne what needs to be done in order to ensure the continent gets to where we want it to be. So I'm saying that I hope that we're all of us here because we're inspired by that objective. And uh, hopefully Maureen and uh, these teachers here and, and, and this university uh, will indeed uh, help at least to impart uh, some of the knowledge that all of us need in order to transform ourselves into that agent of change uh, on the continent. So that by the time we finish, uh, that pool, that pool of those agents of change should have expanded 
because as I was saying, I think without that, we will not be able to solve these problems which, which the continent faces. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, patron. I can see the hands are already flying into the air. Okay? Okay, what we're going to do is we have one hour, slightly less actually, to go through the session. I'm going to be asking you to ask one question, each one of you. I'm really going to ask those that have participated in the program in the past to not take this opportunity away from the new class. You ask your question, one person, one question, very brief, to the point, I'll take a round of three, we give maybe three, four, we give the patron the opportunity to answer, we take another three, then we move on to other business. Is that good? Thank you. Good, good afternoon, uh, patron and to uh, colleagues. My name is Tiamo Moleme. Um, mm -hmm. I'm from the town of Mahikeng in the Northwest province. My question, well, I had two, but I'll just You're take allowed one. one. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I just want to know, uh, you know, I've, I've read the book, uh, The Dream Defeat by Mark Fesser, which he indicated that the patron is intending to write one day. And uh, my question is, you know, I know he's busy with, you are busy with uh, Sudan and uh, other African matters, but my question is, uh, when can we expect uh, this, this book from you? And I, I really hope that you invite me to the book launch <laughs> when, when it opens. My name is Ngengelezi Wiseman Masugo. Yes, Wiseman. I'm from a show, but now I'm based in the Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. uh, my question that I would like to ask is from the political economy uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we address the issue of land without human destruction? Okay. Why I'm asking this question is that uh, how do we deal with the issue of land without fighting, without affecting agriculture as the driver of economy in, in, in the African continent? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Quite brief and to the point. That's Thank you very much. My name is Simo Zulu from Eskawini, KwaZulu Natal. Okay. Um, Mr. President, in terms of your own assessment of the first decade of the African, uh, uh, that the African Union was established, how would you define or characterize the nature of the relations between the African continent and, and, and our former colonial powers? Uh, to what extent have we succeeded as Africans in defining the nature of our relations with the rest of the world? If not, why not? And what can we do as, as Africans about this? Thank you. Um, my name is Bridget Birunji, and I'm Ugandan. Um, my question is, um, uh, with South Africa on the BRICS, um, how then would you involve the rest of Africa, uh, especially with the last conference in China, uh, the delegation from South Af uh, the delegation from Africa was only South African. I want to find out, or maybe just ask the president, uh, what wise words which would he have uh, for the new AU chairperson um, in terms of her finding a way to bridge the obvious gap you know, between the Francophonie and Anglophonie countries. And let us see her election as heading to the continent. Okay. Thank you. Which one? I would say to Sharon, don't, don't believe this story that uh, what this uh, contest for the Chairpersonship of the AU Commission was uh, uh, split along, divided along Francophone, Anglophone lines. That's not correct. Uh, I, I, I've seen that story put out in the media, uh, but it's not, it's not correct. That wasn't the problem. Um, but I think that, uh, as you can see, I mean, you remember that the uh, this, this election should have taken place uh, in January, and uh, the continent couldn't agree. Uh, and in the end, uh, it took place now, and again had to go through a number of votes. Uh, so I think that what that tells all of us 
is that clearly there is a need uh, to, do, to engage in some process of reconciliation. Um, I think within the continent. Uh, I think it would be important to, to find out, to have some clearer idea as to why people voted the way they did. And I'm saying it was not because of Anglophone, Francophone division. Uh, I think it would be necessary to have some sense as to why people voted the way they did in order to address that, that particular problem. And in, I, in particular, I think that uh, uh, we, we've got to strengthen the, the, that process of interaction, I'm saying reconciliation among ourselves as Africans around this issue, I think needs to result in a, in a strengthening of a sense of cohesion uh, within the continent. Because you have seen that uh, uh, in the recent past, uh, the continent has pulled in different directions with regard to important questions. If you take, for instance, a matter of uh, uh, what happened in Cote d'Ivoire uh, after the presidential elections, end of November 2010, um, there were differences about how to handle that situation. There were dif differences about how to handle the situation in Libya. Um, so. I, th I think it's going to be very important that uh, we don't allow the matter of this contest about who should chair the AU Commission, uh, we should not allow that that matter adds, adds to the divisions that we've seen on our continent. Because uh, uh, that's directly relevant to the matter that was raised by Smozulu about relations between Africa, former colonizers, our place in the world, and all of that. Because it's quite obvious that as we have demonstrated that kind of weakness, and that those divisions among ourselves, and those things speaking in different voices, acting in different ways, that's opened the space for these former colonizers and others then to do what they, they think is in their interest and what they need to do with regard to the continent. So it is important that we build up that sense of unity because if we don't, uh, clearly, uh, then this process uh, really of, of neo-colonialism will take root uh, on the continent. Uh, so uh, what I would say with regards to this question that was, to, that was put by, by Simo is that uh, my fear is that uh, recent events relating not only to Africa, but elsewhere in the world, recent events suggest very, very strongly that uh, the major Western powers uh, that have dominated the world, economically, politically, and otherwise, uh, they are, that appetite to dominate is increasing. Uh, you've seen, uh, when, when was it last week, or well, last week, when Kofi Annan uh, resigned, as the mediator for of the AU of the, sorry of the UN and the Arab League to resolve the, the Syrian question, and the reason he couldn't do anything about it is that the very same people who said you are our peace envoy, go and talk to the Syrians and let's resolve this matter peacefully. The very same people were the ones who were feeding weapons into that, into that conflict. They didn't want a peaceful resolution, but they had to pretend that they wanted it. And so, I mean, you have people who uh, very bravely uh, will say, it is time for Assad to go. 
a foreigner from 10,000 kilometers away. Why do they think they've got a right to tell us how to go? Um, or you have a, a foreign minister visiting, you remember this, a, a foreign minister visiting Libya and saying uh, publicly, uh, after, after Gaddafi had been murdered, uh, we came, we saw, he died. <laughs> How do you laugh at the death of a person? Doesn't matter who it is. It's not in our culture, certainly. Uh, but I'm saying that to say I, my sense is that that appetite to dominate by these the, the Western countries um, is increasing. And you can see the boldness, the boldness with which they act. Decision gets taken, uh, let's impose a no-fly non, non zone uh, over Libya in order to protect civilians. That's what the Security Council says. And all that happens is that this uh, NATO Air Force intervenes and other forces, ground forces even, they intervene to ensure the overthrow of the Libyan government. And indeed, in the carrying out of that operation, they kill many, many more civilians than were killed by the Libyan army. People, same people said we are there to protect civilians. But I'm saying, driven by this greater appetite, to dominate. And therefore, I think that this is a challenge that we face. This is a challenge that you face. Uh, when we were, was talking earlier about this challenge of leadership on the continent, that if we don't address this particular matter, we're going to make many mistakes. Because indeed, part of the reason there is a, a success with regard to that process of entrenching neocolonialism on the continent is because of our weakness. It's because we open the doors for this thing to happen. Um, the <clears throat> in, in that context, it's clear that one of the things that we have to do uh, as, as, the, uh, as Africans is to strengthen what historically are known as uh, South-South relations. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a, for some years now, there has been a regular process of interaction uh, between uh, uh, the continent Africa and India based on a, on a formal agreement between the Indians and, 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 and ourselves. And there's been a similar process of uh, interaction between Africa and China. Uh, again, based on a formal agreement between Africa and China. Which is why there was this uh, uh, meeting in China recently that has been referred to, uh, which was not a BRICS meeting, but it was that uh, Africa-China a meeting. Uh, this bridge tray raises this, this particular issue. Uh, that I think it's important that we have to strengthen that South-South relationship. Uh, you will hear, I'm sure all of us, hear this all the time, about uh, uh, the intentions of the Chinese with regard to Africa, that these are the new colonizers and these Africans must be very scared of these people. I think I was saying somewhere, uh, maybe here, that when we grew up, uh, <coughs> as, my, as, a, as a child, as a young person, uh, I, I went to primary school in Queenstown, in the Eastern Cape. Um, that's one of them. Just, I, different primary schools, but uh, I also went to Queenstown. And the second last uh, street of Queenstown, 
white Queenstown. Second Lance, last street, uh, for some reason, I have never been able to find out, was occupied by Africans. And the last street before the township, they had shops there. So we stayed in this, uh, what was called Scanland Street. Um, and behind us were the shops and further on the African township. And this street behind us had some uh, uh, Chinese traders. So <coughs> staying with my uncle in, uh, in Queenstown, the, uh, what they would do, particularly my aunt, his wife, whenever she wanted to frighten us, she would say, <coughs> I will send you to the Chinese. Because <laughs> she had a story that uh, showed and they've got a shop where you can buy all sorts of things. But behind there, there are big pots and they like eating Africans. <laughs> so, so they will get you and they will cook you there. <laughs> so they're still frightening us about the Chinese, that they want to eat us. Yeah. But the important point about the relationship between ourselves and China, as I was saying, is that there is actually a formal agreement between ourselves as Africans and China about the nature of the relationship, including the economic relations. Those relations are governed, are governed by an agreement which was formally negotiated between the two. My view is that there's a bit of a problem about that. And the problem is not Chinese or the Chinese. The problem is us. Because when they then come, they say, all right, we agreed that uh, China needs raw materials and Africa needs to develop and transform its economy, not just to be an exporter of raw materials. Agreed, fine, okay. These are the raw materials we want. Now, in what uh, industry do you want us to invest? Uh, then run into problems. Even just of designing a project to say, okay, here is an investment project that you, the Chinese, must look at in the context of this. So I'm saying it becomes an unequal relationship, not because of what the Chinese are doing, but because of what we are not doing. We don't have a similar agreement with the Americans or the French or the British or the Germans or any of these people. We can regulate the relationship between Africa and China on the basis of the agreement that has been concluded. So, so I think that the, uh, the fact, the reason, it's, it's clear that the reason that the, the, BRIC, the BRIC countries uh, uh, agreed that South Africa should join them because clearly you could not have an organization like that which would have people from Latin America, people from Asia, people from Europe, and nobody from Africa. Um, I think it was correct that they should do that. But I think the more important relationship for us as Africans is this one that is defined by the agreements we have with the Chinese and with the Indians. Uh, and indeed, because it's quite clear, I'm, I'm sure all of us are familiar with this, that uh, already the uh, uh, China is the Chinese economy is the second biggest in the world, uh, with all manner of predictions being made about when it's going to be the first biggest. So clearly, it's in our interest to make sure that we construct a relationship with China, which is mutually beneficial. And in this case, fortunately, it's possible to do it. Sit down, negotiate, and agree practically what is it that we do on the basis of this. But it means that we should have people like yourselves who are able to sit on the other side of the table, conscious of the African challenges, and be able to negotiate an agreement properly. Including not agreeing to be bribed. <laughs> There's a, a, there's a book which uh, 
which was published, uh, I think, towards the end of 2010, if not last year, 2011, by a British academic. <coughs> Um, this academic had spent uh, 10 years following the process of uh, uh, land distribution in Zimbabwe. Uh, <coughs> thanks. He was uh, following up on this, studying this for 10 years. So he's written a book. Um, I'll, I'll find the name of the author of the title and give it tomorrow so you can ask it so that you can buy it. <laughs> it's important to read it. Uh, this is a British uh, academic who says, contrary to all of these negative things that have been said about the land distribution, a program in Zimbabwe, it's actually benefited 350,000 families. You've got new farmers there, who, because now they have land. And it says uh, the story that uh, this land reform had to do with uh, uh, distributing land among cronies, the leadership of ZANU-PF and government and so on. It says not true. In fact, this is the most important process of a fair distribution of land that the whole world has seen in recent times. And then he says, the second thing that he, he, he wants to correct is the notion that that redistribution of the land has destroyed agriculture. This is not true. In fact, what has happened is that the agricultural production that was lost from these large commercial farms has in fact been replaced by production that comes from smaller, smaller farms owned by this African population. I'm sure that none of you have seen any review of this book in our media. Naturally. They would not review it because it's not saying what they would like to hear. Uh, you see, don't redistribute land the way that it was done in Zimbabwe here, because look at it, it's failed. This cronyism and agricultural production has dropped, and it's not true. Now, this is an Englishman who says that, and an English academic who, as I say, followed this thing for a whole period of 10 years. So he was with the process all the time. They don't review the book here because it does not tell the story that they want to hear. So it is possible to redistribute land in a manner, uh, I'm re just responding to the matter that was raised by Ngengeles, in a manner that does not destroy agriculture. It's possible. Uh, we, uh, all of us, uh, all of us, uh, try to persuade the Zimbabweans not to handle this matter of land distribution in the manner that they did. Uh, what they did, they handled it in the way that they did. Uh, they didn't listen uh, to us. Now, of course, now when I see these things in this book, I say, but maybe they were right. Uh, because in reality, uh, I challenge the professor here to give me an example over the last 100 years where you've had a process of land redistribution to benefit ordinary peasants, where you've had a process of land redistribution that has been done nicely. Yeah. <laughs> True, I mean, whether in China or Russia or Mexico, example doesn't exist. <clears throat> the landowners are not going to give up their land nicely. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, so I'm saying that uh, the, uh, 
uh, we, we said to this, my friends, please don't handle this thing like this. Uh, let's do it another way. And, and part of our problem, of course, was that the British failed us. Um, in 1998, I, uh, there was a, the noise was picking up in Zimbabwe on this land question. So, um, so I spoke to President Mugabe and said, uh, look, the, uh, why don't you allow us to talk to the British government on this thing, for the British government to meet its commitment made as a negotiating the independence of Zimbabwe to meet its commitment to give you the money for you to be able to get this land and pay compensation to the landowners. Uh, instead of uh, fighting it in the streets, we'll, we'll talk to them. He agreed. So I said, President, please, if you could uh, keep quiet for three months uh, <coughs> on this matter. we we'll speak on others issues, but not this one. So he agreed. <coughs> so indeed, we spoke to the to the Prime Minister Tony Blair at the time uh, and discuss this thing. It so happened that during that year, this was 98, um, the British uh, had their budget surplus and so did the Canadians, the Australians and the New Zealand as a white commonwealth. So we said to Tony Blair that, look, why don't you meet the commitment that was made by the British government to give the Zimbabweans the money that was, that was promised by your government, previous government, so that they can handle this land redistribution process differently. And we said to him, look, if you agree, and we want you to agree, we will then go to the rest of the Commonwealth for them to contribute funds to assist uh, in this. So Tony Blair agreed. Said, okay, I agree. We'll do that. But don't worry about mobilizing any other people. We will do that ourselves. So we said, fine. And indeed they did. So there was a conference that was held, an international conference, pledging conference that was held in Zimbabwe in 98. British were there, and the European Union were there, and, and the, the World Bank, and, 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 and everybody, the UN Development Program, and monies were pledged to help Zimbabwe to compensate these white farmers for the land that they were going to lose. Uh, done. Six months after, disagreement, the British started going around all of the donors, saying don't give the money you promised. 